we have just stepped across the threshold of the last month of 2017. It feels like yesterday we stood here birthing 2017. Has he done anything for you in 2017? Anything. Anything changed in your life. See, if, if, you, if you're really pursuing heaven on earth, and you know who he is. You ought to be living in more peace, more wisdom, more balance, more anointing, more strategy than you did in January 2017. So can we just look in his face and say, there's nobody like you, Lord. Nobody like you, Lord. I've proven you over and over again, but there's nobody like you. I searched and I looked, but there's nobody like you. I tried to find it in other things, but there's nobody like you. See, there, there are things in your relationship with Christ that, that really can't be explained. You just have to kind of experience it. You have to know that you have to have had that moment that when you just say, Jesus, help me. And he does. See, see, in my walk with him, there are large explosive moments. And then there's those moments when I don't have explosive prayers coming out of my system. When I don't feel like quoting any of his word. When I've been slapped with a life crisis. And I've learned that when you just say, Jesus, you access, you access, you have access to all authority, all power. See, when you have Jesus Christ as your Savior and you believe with all of your life that he put his life on a cross and before he bowed his head, he said, it is finished. See, I've learned that you have to define what your it is. And when you mature in God enough to say, okay, sir, this is my it that I am done with. I'm done with the the nightmares. I'm done with the fear. I'm done with the bondage. I'm done with the unnecessary boundaries. I am done. I'm drawing a line. This is my it line. Then you can stand with his authority because the Bible says he dwells in you. Your Bible says his rivers of authority roll out of you. His word is in you. So when you define your it, you can look at your situation and say, it, you are finished. I have named you it, and it is finished. You may rear your head again, but I'm not listening. You may try to, see, see your enemy only has one bag of tricks. And if you learn to, to define and recognize those tricks, then the older you get in Christ, you're not dismayed because he's just got a little bag. It's fear. It's intimidation. It's sending thoughts into your pretty little head. And when you learn to recognize, okay, that's just something I've done. I've, I've dealt with this before. I've heard this before because he, your enemy is not a creator. You understand that? The enemy of your life is not a creator, but the Lord of your life is a creator. So your enemy cannot create anything new. All he can do is what he's always done. So somebody just needs to say, there's nobody like you, Lord. I searched and I looked, and I've proven you. There's nobody like you, Lord. Nobody. 
We're going to talk for a few minutes. You can be seated for just a few minutes. This team's going to stay here and help me for just a second. On the subject, watch your tone. Now, did anybody have one of those mamas? I had one and I was one. I am one. I have been guilty of saying, don't look at me with that tone. Don't speak to me in that tone. Anybody heard that in your life? Everybody had, everybody had to do a do-over? My parents were the, the champions of do-overs. If you slammed the door, Victoria, you had to go back. Did you have to do that? I hated that. And you know what I did? Felicia, I would go with that door. And right before I got to the click, I'd click it softly. I know all the rest of y'all are Christians. That's okay. There's some door slammers up here among us. You know, when we would stomp up the stairs, we were made to come back and walk the stairs nicely because the tone of our steps was ugly. You know, I hated those moments where you had to tell your sisters you were sorry and you loved them because in that moment you were not sorry and you sure did not love them. I saw something on, on social media that this mother put her kids in the same T-shirt. Now, that's child abuse. Oh, Jesus. But it's a good idea. <laughs> Just put the same shirt over their two heads and let, tell them to work it out. You know, but we've all been there. And you just, I, I, I don't love you, but I'm sorry. I mean, you know, you say it through gritted teeth. Because the tone that we have is obvious. So, see, our, our world is, here's, here's kind of a picture of our world. It's just chaotic. You know, you turn the news on and it's madness. You get in the political system, it's madness. You get in the, the school system, it's madness. Sometimes it's madness in the church. It can be madness on your job. It can be madness in your marriage. So I want this team to, to define for you what discord sounds like. Is this how your marriage sounds? Is this how it is when you go to work? When you turn the nightly news on? When you log into Facebook? When you read your nasty Twitters? Kind of how it sounds. In some churches in America, and there's some poor pastor standing in a pulpit trying to minister to. I think I'd just leave. Now, we really think that in a perfect world, we all are the same. We're all on the same note and everything is just perfect so give me one of those notes guys that's a little beige for me just let me hear it again see that's just like our four and no more it's a social club and if you don't look like me you don't dress like me, you don't talk like me, and you don't live in the same kind of house as me, then we can't be together. So give me that note one more time. That's a little boring. I would get very tired of that in just a minute. That's not reality. Because God created our universe to be in harmony together. He created, he put the song in the birds. He put the bark in the dog. He put the meow in the cat. He put the roar in the lion. And here's how we try and we do sound at Metro Tab if they're good. We 
We're created to live in harmony together. We don't all speak the same part. We don't speak, sing the same note. We don't live on the same street. We have different life avenues that bring us together. So you got to learn how to do this. Do you, see, do, you, do you hear them finding their note? Now sing the chord again, and I want you to find a note that blends with this. Now find you a note. See, God created the universe to live in harmony. That's why the sun has to stay in its place, and the moon has to stay in its place, and the stars have an assignment in their place. And he told all of creation, watch your tone. This is your assigned tone. Watch your tone. Stay on your watch. One more time. You guys sound good. So that's kind of how life is supposed to sound. I may pull you guys back. So just go, you can go sit down for just a second. I know you've been standing for just a minute. See, when you talk about watching your tone, tone is quality in music. Tone is the manner in which you conduct your life. It's the character that you choose to develop. It's your tendency. What is your, what is your tendency? What's your tendency? Tone sets the atmosphere. Tone is, is the mood. See, when you go to a dentist office, they will have what I call elevator music playing. It's supposed to calm you. I need drugs, not your music. That happy stuff that puts you in a place where you don't care what they do to you. You know, you know if you're having surgery, they'll ask you, you know, for day surgery or, or full-blown surgery, they'll say, you know, does it bother you if we go ahead and strap you down? Yes, it bothers me. I need you to give me one of those things in my arm, and I need to be out. I don't want to know if you're taking my clothes off, you're strapping me down, you putting stuff down my throat, don't do all that while I'm gone. And when I wake up, I want all my clothes back on like I have been on for three hours. So it's, it's the mood. A tone can also be shades. There are, there are different tones of colors in the world, different shades. Now, I'll tell you this, if you don't watch your tone, you'll find yourself throwing some shade. That was just too good not to say. So when you, you know, when you turn on the, you know, the, the news, it's, it's bad news, it's calamity, it's disaster, it's tragedies. You know, the tone of our music is deception and breakups and cheating and drug abuse and lying and, and name calling and heartbreak. The tone of the weather is always going to be partly cloudy tomorrow. They never say it's going to be partly sunny tomorrow. They'll tell you about storms and blizzards because clear weather is just no news at all. The tone of the church is segregated, divided, and critical. So here's what I want to say to you, Metro Tab. Every time you see this screen today, I need you with a real sassy voice to turn to somebody and say, you better watch your tone. Practice on them now. Watch your tone. Psalm 100 says this, shout triumphantly to the Lord, serve the Lord with celebration. Man, there's some Christians who need to underline that line right there. Come before him with shouts of joy. Know that the Lord is God. He made us. It goes on to say in, part, in, in another translation, we are the sheep of his pasture. Enter his gates with thanks. Enter his courtyards with praise. Thank him. Bless his name. Why? Because the Lord is good. And that's not enough. Because his faithfulness lasts generation after generation after generation after generation after generation. Tell somebody. 
You better watch your tone. Now see, in, if you look up the term tone deaf, it means you can't match musical tones. There are those people that mean you're a bad person. It just means you don't have that gift. You know, what's bad is some folks who think they can match them and they want to be on a, a team. You know, around here we believe in miracles. Way back in the day, there was a kid in our ministry. I'd never seen a kid with a greater desire to sing. His whole family sang. He just couldn't. I mean, he, it just, just was not his gift. And he wanted to sing so bad. We were doing a recording project with the church. We got a really good sound engineer, really good producer to come in and help us. We shot the reverb to him. If you're not musical and you're not up here, you don't know what the reverb is. It gives you a little echo. Gives you a little padding when you go flat and sharp and, you know, all that stuff. Just makes you sound better than what you are, basically. So we padded everything we could, we could pad around him. And, you know, he had, a, he had a part on that recording project, and he sounded really good. Now, it was, it was a, it was a one-shot deal because he couldn't reproduce it on a stage with a mic in his hand. But we fulfilled that kid's fantasy. Took a lot of padding around that. He probably couldn't cut this team up here in this day. That was another day and another dollar. <laughs> when you're tone deaf, you're insensitive to different notes. You're insensitive to different feelings and expressions in the music. But we can't live tone deaf. You can get by with not singing. But we can't live... We can't live out of tune with others. Have you, I hope you're not that person. Maybe you've just met that person who's just insensitive to others. They just blurp it out. Whatever hits their brain comes out their mouth. There ought to be a filter system in place called the Holy Spirit, called common decency, called kindness, and niceness that everything that hits your little pea brain don't need to come out your mouth. You know, my dad used to say, before you share a piece of your mind, you need to be sure you've got a piece to share. Some of us don't have enough mind to share. We need to keep all we got and fertilize it and hope it grows a little bit more. We can't be insensitive to others face to face, I, you know, I'm always uncomfortable when, when things are said in someone's presence and, presence and it causes them to lose face. A lot of things are done in jest. A lot of families are very sarcastic with each other. But if you step back and watch the maneuvering in that family, they're cutting each other. It's okay to joke about something that somebody cannot, about something they can help, about something that's, that's, that's frivolous. Never make fun of somebody about something they cannot help. Just be nice. Just be nice to each other. And, you know, sarcasm is fun and, and joking and, and, and jest is fun. But you got to watch those levels. Because all of a sudden, you'll start telling the truth in your sarcasm. And it gets feeling real good. But it's cutting real deep. And you'll find it yourself in an all-out brawl. And when you go to war, you're going to bleed. You need to make sure that when you bleed, it's worth your bloodshed. Now, social media is another whole category. I have never seen more insensitive people in my life. People sit in the privacy of their homes with their cell phones and they hit a send button and a post button and they're committing emotional murder. It's wrong. It is wrong. We don't have the right just because it's our page to post anything we want to post. Your opinions are not that important. Keep them to yourself. Or I will unfollow your cute little self. I have cleaned up my news feed. You say, can you, do you unfriend? Not a lot. I unfollow. There's a button called, if you go to their page and just click unfollow, you can take their rubbish out your newsfeed. 
Do you know that? And if they're really rubbish, unfriend them. But we live in a society that's insensitive to each other. And this thing called social media has given us the right to say things that we would not say to someone's face. And we're dividing ourselves like insanity. You know, there are people who criticize other people and then they're caught in the same sin. Happened just this week, folks. High-ranking people criticize other high-ranking people. I'm not going to keep your mouth shut unless your closet's clean. And everybody's got a closet. Everybody's got some stuff in the closet. It's just better keep your mouth shut, be kind, show grace and mercy, give honor to the office and the positions. Say, well, I don't. Well, go ahead. We know how you feel. Paul showed us how to live. In Philippians chapter 1, verse 12, we're going to start there. He showed us how to be confident while you're going through a thing. Let's read in Philippians 1 verses 12 through 14. Starting in verse 12. I want you to know dear ones. And I love this. The, the TPT. If you've not gotten the, the Passion Translation yet. It's amazing. It's a, it's a pretty new release. I love the translation. Go check it out. Verse 12 says. I want you to know dear ones. What has happened to me has not hindered. But helped my ministry of preaching the gospel causing it to expand and spread to many people. Verse 13. For now, the elite Roman guards and government officials overseeing my imprisonment have plainly recognized I am here because of my love for the anointed one. Verse 14. And what I'm going through has actually caused many believers to become even more courageous in the Lord and to be bold and passionate to preach the word of God all because of my chains. Paul wrote these words while sitting chained with an iron cuff on one hand and bound to a Roman soldier on the other. And Paul turned his imprisonment into getting some prisoners, some, some prisoners and some prison guards saved. There are things that we have all been forced to walk through in life and we have questioned God. Why is this so hard? Why am I having to go through this? Why is my struggle so wide and so deep and so long? Anybody honest enough to say I've asked those questions? I've asked those questions. I often think of our Honduras experience. Brittany sent me a picture the other day of a beautiful single mom fighting for her life to get out a gorgeous little girl from Honduras. Honduras is on the verge of a coup politically right now. It is very chaotic. And I thank God that we are not fighting the battle she's fighting. But I fell on my face in my spirit. I said, God, help that mom. Give her, give her pathways of favor and pathways of grace and mercy to get that baby out of that country. And you wonder in your personal life, why, am I, why doesn't God just deliver us all out of everything? As soon as we pray, that'd be really, really good, kind of him. Don't you think so? I think it'd be a very kind and loving father. As soon as I pray, he would deliver me from the mess I'm in. I mean, hello, you love me, right? But see, we did this thing called commitment to Christ. And we became his ambassadors. And we said, you can use us to bring folks into your kingdom. See, we pray some crazy prayers. But you got to pray it to have him. I want you to say these underlined words with me and let it speak to your spirit. Whatever, if you've just, if you're going through something, if you just come out of something... If you're not going through a thing, just, just shout and rejoice and celebrate and high-five your own self because in just a minute, you'll be going through something else. So if you ain't going through nothing today, just slap yourself on a high-five and say, oh, thank you, Jesus. I'm, I'm okay right now. Because in three seconds, it could be something else. 
Say this with me. What I'm going through has actually caused many believers to become even more courageous. You need to understand that and lock it into your life. When you are required to walk through a thing, you need to walk through your thing with confidence, knowing that when you get to the other side, you've just become a light to get somebody else out of what they're in. See, it's one thing for me to tell you that God can deliver you from cancer. But I've never had cancer. But stand up, Melody. This lady can say, take my hand. I have been delivered. There are those in your life you've wondered why this horrible divorce in my life. But you survived. Because I can promise you this. At the desk next to you where you work, there is going to come a divorce that's going to slam their lives. And that divorcee needs somebody with some sense and some God anointing to say, baby, you can get through this madness. Take me by the hand. Let me show you how I got out. See, you're going to find a, a daddy or a mom with kids who are just losing their minds. Somebody in your world needs a word coming out of your spirit. They need your story. That's why we tell you get in a life group in this church because somebody needs you to speak life to them in a group. Because in this group here is a large group. Everybody doesn't get to tell their story every Sunday. But you get in a life group, you start doing life together. You start learning how to sing in harmony together. You start realizing that, wow, your story is different than mine, but mine harmonizes with yours like this. We were both delivered. We were both blessed. We were both frustrated. We both got an answer. You start living in harmony together. Tell somebody. You better watch your tone. Paul showed us how to live. He told us how to be confident while you're going through a thing. He told us how to be joyful in spite of others. Oh, Jesus, that's a big one, isn't it? Verses 15 through 18. There are some who preach Christ out of competition and controversy. Mm. For they are jealous over the way God has used me. Many others have purer motives. They preach with grace and love. Because they know I've been destined for the purpose of defending the revelation of God. Those who preach Christ with ambition and competition are insincere. They just want to add to the hardship of my imprisonment. So some must have been gloating in Paul's life. That, oh, look at the big boy. He's finding his little big self in prison. So much for his big ministry. See, Paul was a spiritual powerhouse. And there were other, believe it or not, in that day, never in this day, jealous ministers who were deliberately trying to cause Paul trouble. So Paul is saying, hey guys, I've had a few dog days like the rest of y'all. You know, when you get that promotion and somebody tries to cut your legs out from underneath you, when you get the accolade, you know, in, in the employee meeting, and they go out the door talking about you. Well, who do you think you are? Well, I think I'm blessed and highly favored who I think I am. I think I work later than you. What I, those are the things you want to say. I think your little car pulls out of the parking lot at 430. I come out at 530. See, when, when you go the extra, you get the extra. He says, yet in spite of all of this, I am overjoyed. I will continue to rejoice. See, that's a, that's a hard stance to get to sometimes. It's a little difficult when there are things being hurled at you and thrown at you that are undeserving. So I want you to repeat that line out of verse 18 with me. Yet, in spite of all of this, I am overjoyed. You might want to read it like this. Yet in spite of all those people, I am overjoyed. So here's, here's a revelation for you. Everybody will not celebrate you. Everybody will not stay with you. Everybody will not push you to your purpose. It takes a lot of grace and mercy and grit 
on our part to let it go and let them go. Anybody had to let something go? Here's your word of advice. Take the high road. It is the road less traveled. On that little lower road, there'd be lots of traffic jams. When you choose to change and switch gears and go to the high road, it's a little more open spaces. It's what you call soaring with eagles. Some things are worth your passionate concern. Some things are not. Some people are worth your passionate concern. Some people are not. So that sounds ugly. A person has to want to change. You cannot change them. There are people in your life that you will spend years trying to change. And all they want is your attention. All they want is to keep you in turmoil. So you have to define. That's not everybody in your life. But there are some fools. You need to go back on your app and get the message I talked about on fools. Pastor says, you were hard on them. I said, they're fools. That's not everybody. And you can't be a fool. Tell somebody, you better watch your tone. So Paul showed us how to live. He, he told us to be confident when you're going through a thing, to be joyful in spite of other people, and be hopeful when you're uncertain, verses 19 through 20. Because I know that the lavish supply of the Spirit of Jesus, the anointed one, and your intercession for me will bring about my deliverance. Now, he's in prison. Verse 20, no matter what, he's saying, whether I get out of this place or not, whether this is the end of my ministry or not, no matter what, I will continue to hope and passionately cling to Christ so that he will be openly revealed through me before everyone's eyes so I will not be ashamed. In my life or in my death, Christ will be magnified in me. Wow. Wow. See, Paul refused to be crippled by other people's words. When you're going through a thing, you can't submerge yourself in self-pity. You will drown in self-pity. It will go up your nose, in your ears, in your eyes. You will drown in self-pity. Paul refused to take criticism and attacks personally. And when you're in a thing that you can't change and you can't get out of without God Almighty helping you miraculously, this should be our stance. Even though you, there are things that are uncertain and we can't change, we can't determine the outcome, we can't make the outcome be a certain way. This is good when you're in a, in a life or death situation. When you're in a life crisis and you can't control all that's going on around you. If you will tell your Lord and Savior and you talk to your spirit, you'll say, no matter what, yet will I serve him. Whether he delivers me like I'm praying to be delivered or whether I die right here in this spot, I will die clinging to Jesus Christ. And when your enemy realizes that, he turns loose. So let's say these words, underline words only together. No matter what, I will continue to hope and passionately cling to Christ. In my life or in my death, Christ will be magnified in me. That's good stuff. Tell somebody. You better watch your tone. Here is the toughest assignment of all. Paul says, be content. Oh. Well, I ain't content. I don't like it the way it is. It is time for a change. Wow. In verse 21, he says, my true life is the anointed one. And dying means gaining more of him. So when life throws you the largest curveball, the fastest curveball, and the biggest slap you've ever had, you can say like the older translation, 
for me to live as Christ and to die as gain. You know, I heard my dad preach all of my life. And he would say, if I, if I drop dead now this mic, before this mic hits the floor, I'll be standing in glory. And as a kid, I'm like, well, that don't sound too good for those. Some might hit the floor while you stand up there. But the more you mature in Christ, heaven is our goal. Heaven is our goal. And some of us have a lot of reasons to get there. So whatever you're going through and whatever's slapping you, let's say this together. My true life is the anointed one. And dying means gaining more of him. Let me switch this around on you. This translation is talking about the anointing one is Jesus Christ. But let me, tell, let me help you. Your best life is the anointed life. And when you die to yourself, you gain more of him. When you die to your agenda, his agenda takes over. When you die to your, your selfishness and our self-pity, his agenda takes over. So my best life, my true life, my only life is the anointed one. Wow. His word is amazing. Tell somebody. See, when you watch your tone, you learn to dance with your chains on. So you just, you hear people, that you hear chains rattling. What you doing? I'm just practicing my tone. And you learn that the enemy is under your feet and you have the right to put your foot, your spiritual foot on his nasty little head and you can dance with, see, if you learn to dance with your chains on, honey, you're crazy free when you get them things off. The Bible talks about a sacrifice of praise. Go home and study the word sacrifice. Sacrifice is not fun. It's not normal. It doesn't come natural because we are selfish. We're born into this world. We cry to get our diaper changed. We cry to get our food. We cry to get somebody else to hold us. Oh, that will preach right there. People still crying to get somebody else to hold you. That's another whole message for another day. That was just enlightenment right there. But when you learn to dance and give a sacrifice of praise in your spirit, regardless of when you're going through a thing, you learn to be content. You learn to be hopeful when everything is uncertain. You learn to do life in spite of others. You learn to dance with your chains on. Then Christ can start using your life to set somebody else free. When you watch your tone, you find a need and you feel it. When you watch your tone, you get delivered from others' opinions. And that is not just a one-time act of grace. So don't think you can just pile up in an altar somewhere or get at the foot of your bed this afternoon and say, Now, Father, I will never again be bothered by other people's opinions. You just wasted your breath because you will be bothered. So it will be a continual act of grace. In your life. Because we're flesh. We want to be liked. We want to be approved. We want to be accepted. But I can flip back a few screens. Ain't everybody going to celebrate you. Ain't everybody going to stay with you. All you English teachers love that word ain't, right? That will translate really well when they're translating this message. Change that word. You get delivered from other people's motives and their criticisms. You learn to ignore they say. If you do research, when somebody says, you know, well, they say, well, who's they? It's the Auntie Susie. That's who all they is. And most of they are not concerned about you. They is only concerned about them. You are not their focus. They don't care enough about you. 
You learn the freedom of running with winners when you learn, when you hang with folks that have learned to watch their tone and how they live. You learn to run with winners. And when you learn on the high road and you start flying with some winners, there's some fresh air, there's some bright blue sky, and there's nobody trying to pull you down. Your fears are calmed. You have a daily dose of fresh hope and you live in peace and you stop that chaotic turmoil. I'm going to challenge you to let go and live free. Let go. Just hold up your, just put your negative thinking right here in your hand. Put it in your hand and hold your fist up and throw it right now. Let go of negative thinking. If you die tomorrow, you'll die better positive. Let go of your need to fix everybody else's unhappiness. Because it's impossible. Let go of your drive to compete and compare yourself. You know, women do this probably in a different arena than men do. You know, most men cannot tell you what any woman had on this building today. But them girlfriends can say, well, she had on boots and she had on high heels. Look at them high heels. Why does she think them shoes match that vest? Look at her hair. Who, who told her to put that pink stuff in her hair? Women are, are not nice sometimes. Here's one going to hit all of us. Let go of your adult children. They need to grow up. <laughs> they need to grow up and it may hurt them and it may hurt you for a minute but growing up is hard to do I think there's a song called breaking up is hard to do but growing up is hard to do but at some point they got to learn what adulting looks like you know I, I told a young adult a few hours ago you know because it, it's difficult I remember going home from college my first trip home and I went back into mom and dad's church and and I I left the building and didn't tell them I was leaving well, hello, I got chastised, and rightfully so. But I was an adult. You know, I had been at college. I had been away. But here's the fact. I had been away driving their car, on their gas, wearing their clothes, on their school bill. So I really wasn't adulting. And because I happened to be in another city and I could get by with not telling them everything I was doing, when you come back under that roof, you know, I told a young adult the other day, I said, I, said, I, I know you're, you're, you're flexing your muscles and, and you feel like you're an adult. I said, but adults pay for their own roof, their own cars, their own insurance, their own food and their own clothes. I said, so until you graduate into that arena, you're going to have to flex a little bit because you're still under that roof. Because if they cut all that stuff out, you're going to be homeless. And you don't look real cute on the street. So it's, you know, and, and adult children are staying home a whole lot longer than they used to. I look back now and I'm thinking, Lord, I left way too soon. I mean, I left a big old nice house and cars that were paid for. And whew, sometimes you want to go back now. Like, can I move back in? Let mama buy the groceries. Thank you, Jesus. Let go of your excuses. Don't be so predictable. Life is not a box. And some of y'all are boxy. Woo, some of y'all, you got these lines in life. And, and nobody can't color out them lines. I know in kindergarten we're taught to color within the lines, but live dangerous. Just take your crayon and go outside the line. Oh, it might feel good. Just live reckless. Just get you a, get you a sheet to color today and just color outside. Just because you can. Live free. Tell somebody. Watch your tone. I want us to declare a thing at the close of this message. Let's say it together. I will shout triumphantly to the Lord. Why don't you do that right now? Why don't you do that right now? Next line. I will serve the Lord 
with celebration. Adam, get your dream team sign up. We're about to have a landslide. Oh, and that quiet got. Did you hear how quiet it got? Next line. I will sing with joy in his presence. Rob, get your sign up list because they're all going to come to you wanting to sing now. Here's the next line. It's going to hurt all y'all. I will thank him with an offering. Get ready for a landslide blessing today, Pastor. Whoop. Because he keeps his promises to all generations. One more time, let's say it all that together. I will shout triumphantly to the Lord. I will serve the Lord with celebration. I will sing with joy in his presence. I will thank him with an offering because he keeps his promises to all generations. Now take a moment and bless him. 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 I bless you, Lord. I thank you, Father. I bless your name. I bless you. I bless you. You have been better than good to me. You have been so good to me. Your grace and your mercy is astounding in my life. I bless you. 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 Just take some moments in this Christmas season, in this crazy holiday time. Just take some moments in your life and check your tone because you're going to run into some tones that are sour. They're off key. But anytime you run into a tone that doesn't sound right, it's usually an indicator there's hurt in that life. There's pain. And then baby, Squeaky got a tone of pain and rejection and anger and fear. All those are life tones that people speak. And they start expressing their tones because of where they've been through and where they've been and what they've come through, what's been done to them. So I pray for an anointing to rest on this house and on you guys watching via the internet. And for, if you're watching or listening to this tape or watching via video on the app later on, I pray that the anointed one, Jesus Christ, will blanket you with a tone of his love, with a tone of his grace, with tones of his mercy. Because when we are in tune with his tone, then we can take somebody by the hand so I can help get you in the right key, baby. I can help you learn a new song. We can change your life tone. There may be abuse. There's abuse in my background, but I can help you change yours too. There's divorce in my background, but I can help you change yours too. There's been sickness and calamity in my life, but I can take you to the master conductor who will tune you up. And when he tunes you up, your tone changes. And you start talking about hope. And you start talking about life forever. And generational blessings and not cursings. See, I just pray for a tone change in all of our lives. That the shade we bring into a room or the atmosphere we bring in to our homes. I pray that if your, your home is in discord, that it will line up with the tone of his word. I pray that if your body is sick, it will come into alignment with the healing tone of God. And if your mind has been just vexed by fears and what ifs, I speak the tone of peace to your mind. I speak the tone of healing to your life, emotionally and financially and spiritually. To your kids, I speak the tone of balance and maturity. Father, I thank you that on this first Sunday in December, whatever tones we've been singing that have been out of tune with you, we give you permission to tune us up. 
just like any orchestra, tunes itself. Some things sound out of kilter for a minute. And it's okay for our lives to be out of kilter for a minute. But we want to sing your tone. We want to live your tone. Because somebody in our world needs your tone. So thank you, Father, for your goodness and your mercy that has reigned in our lives. Without your goodness and mercy, we would not be here today. Our life circumstances would have wiped us out a long time ago. But it is your grace and your mercy. And it is the tone of heaven that has brought us to this moment in our lives. Now help us to extend grace and mercy and to speak your tone in the earth realm. In the strong name of Jesus Christ, we pray.